I'm Travis Gokel, and I'm going to talk about C++11 at SolidFire um, and how we move from our C++03 code base into the new standard. And we did this about a year and a half ago. Um, so it's kind of been a, uh, it was a real learning experience back then, and we've certainly grown as a company. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to give you some lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, so. This talk is going to be really focused around application developers, not necessarily library people. Um, you might be able to get some good information, but at the end of the day, what we develop is an application. We don't give C++ libraries out to other people. Uh, we deliver an application. So, how many people here are still stuck in O3? Nice. Wow, that's a lot of people. So what you're going to get out of this is, uh, first and foremost, you're going to get some code data. And uh, that's my name for, for cool stuff that you can do. You know, it's like the bacon on the end of the stick uh, to kind of tempt you into this new standard. <laughs> um, and hopefully, we'll give you some easier ways to work with that bacon. Um, so we'll also give you kind of an example of a transition, uh, how a company like ours went through a transition. It certainly worked out for us, so that is at least uh, positive. Um, and finally, you'll get a way to convince your boss or your project manager hey, I, it worked for these guys, and I think it'll work for us too. And maybe you'll be able to make that argument. So if you're already using C++11, then you're not going to get the last two, because you're already there. Um, okay, so who's SolidFire? We write a distributed block storage system. So what that means is we tell a bunch of these servers, uh, and they all network together, and we present them as a bunch of iSCSI volumes. Um, so what that means is we focus a lot on scalability, and we're all SSDs, so we care a lot about performance. Um, and our customers are all cloud storage providers. So that kind of affects how we think about our application. Um, we care a lot about correctness. If you lose our corrupt customer data, it's a terrible, terrible thing. So hopefully I'll be able to show you guys how C++11 helps you write uh, correct code more easily. And we also care about performance. Right, that's, our, that's our big selling point. We're all SSDs. That's one of our distinguishing features. So hopefully C++ helps us write performance code. And another thing is we're a very small shop. Uh, when we started this, we had six developers. Now we have 12. Um, but developer time is really, really important to us. Um, so we need to write code that everyone can understand and everyone can debug. So a long time ago, I, I talked to my manager and I said, hey, this C++11 stuff, that's real neat. Let's bring it here. And he said, well, how's that going to impact our schedule? I said, I don't know. Oh, sorry, just one question about the company. You're with us? Yes. So you use GCC? Yes. That's actually really uh, important. We're only, we are uh, GCC only. Um, we don't care about compiling on Windows or anywhere else. Um, that made transitioning really easy, or a lot easier. Um, so, I started to do some more research. And I looked at how the committee was making these changes. And what I noticed was all the old features, well, they're, not, they're certainly not going anywhere. Yeah, we've deprecated them, but they're still there. Auto pointer, you know, maybe you shouldn't use it anymore. But if you have code that uses it, at least it's not going to die. Uh, that's kind of nice. And for the new features that came along, there was no introduced ambiguity with anything that used to exist. So say I want to delete the function foo. In C++03, saying equals delete after a function doesn't even make syntactic sense. So it doesn't interfere with anything. Um, another thing that actually came up yesterday is decal type versus typa. So we actually use GCC, so we can use typa, and we were using typa, uh, which is why it's called decal type. Uh, if you read Howard's uh, discussion of this yesterday. But um, it's kind of nice that these old features are still there, even if uh, they might be frowned upon. We like it. And some of the new features are what I call macro. So if I want to overwrite something, I can easily write a macro that is there in C11 or not there in C03. So at the time, we were using 4.4 with the O3 standard. And we just went right to 4.6 and C++11. I'm just kidding. We didn't do that. 
Um, first, we upgraded to 4.6, and then we went to C++11, mostly because we thought there was less risk in upgrading the compiler than upgrading the standard. That was just the decision. Uh, we were actually wrong about it. There's more risk in upgrading the compiler. It takes way more time. Um, because switching standards is way, way easier. And just a note, uh, the performance impact of upgrading to GCC 4.6 was insignificant. We did not notice any impact on performance. But from switching to C++11, we got 2% performance, which is fairly statistically significant, but it was noticeable. Um, which is really cool, because it means that these, these features like automatic movement are actually beneficial to people. Um, which when I saw them, I was like, oh, that's neat. But does it actually work? Yes, it does. Um, and we're not even that CPU bound, which is pretty cool. So how do we do it? We went through a period of time where we need to compile in both 03 and 11 mode. Um, and back then it was called 0x, because we didn't know it would come out two years after. Um, anyway, so we need to support both these things. It was really easy to do. We have a make file. We made sure the code still worked with that switch turned on. It wasn't hard. Um, and then what we did, we ran the unit tests. Here's what we found. If the code compiled, it would always pass unit tests. There was not a single bug introduced by switching standards. Not a single one. That's really, really awesome. And for people who are like, oh, it's risky, it's not risky at all. It's incredibly unrisky. All right, so there's a little bit of uh, hairiness. Um, when you start thinking about compilers, you should really treat, even if you're using the same one, so in G++ STD03 is not the same compiler as C++11. Yeah, sure, it's got the same backend and all, but they actually are different. And if you think of them that way, it'll make your life way easier. Um, so just a note about GCC, if you give the same post-process source uh, G++, I've never seen it not generate the same code. I don't think there's any guarantee that it does, but it will always generate the same code, at least in my observation. The caveat is, it's never the same post-process source. Um, now here's why. If you have a thing, and you've got one library that's checking, oh, I've got R value refs, and say you compile it with the O3 standard, then it just skips over this block. No big deal. It never emits the symbol for something that's invalid syntax. Uh, in the old standard. Now when your code comes along with the new standard, well you certainly have R value refs, so your compiler's intelligence says, I'm going to do a move, and it'll try to call this function. The problem is, that function wasn't there because you never compiled it into the library. So, always make sure your third party libraries are compiled with the exact same switches. Now you probably heard it a million times, but it goes doubly true for switching the standard. Any linking problem can almost be guaranteed to be not doing this. Um, so be prepared to patch them. <coughs> if you're using open source, it's very easy. It's probably on the developers to do this anyway. No big deal. You know, patch third party libraries. Okay, so here's one of the problems that we ran into. Uh, just as an example of the types of problems that we encountered in the uh, switch. We have this, this type called a size check. Um, and its contract is pretty simple. It, it's exactly like a whatever the T is here, except it checks, uh, it, it's allowed to cast, but only under certain conditions. Um, one of them is like, so casting out is it has to be the same size. Uh, so if you have a size check of, say, in 32s, um, so you have a size check of in 32s, then it's okay to draw out a a UN32, but it's certainly not okay to draw a UN64. That's just one of our little rules. Um, just to give you an example of what we do in our code. Um, so obviously you can push it into a vector. You know, that makes sense. All right, I can push something into the vector. I can insert that into a set. Here's the thing. In C++11, you can't do this. It doesn't work. Why? Because in 03, there was only one insert operation on a set uh, that took a single argument, okay? It takes a uh, constant reference to the value type. Now, it's completely unambiguous because when you look at uh, this operator cast out, 
you can say, all right, well, obviously I want a uh, N32. Um, but the problem is, in C11, they added two new ones. Now, this one doesn't really cause any problems. It's pretty straightforward. It's still asking for a single value type. The second one is an initializer list. That's really helpful if you're doing sets um, of things, you know, to insert a bunch of things. You can have them with an initializer list. The problem is, that made a total ambiguity because now our cast out operator doesn't know, well, do you want the value type or do you want to initialize a list of value types? Okay. We don't want to even look at this one. We would like to get rid of it when, for the purposes of uh, overwrite, or for the purposes of our cast out operator. So how do we solve a problem like that? Well, the first thing we need is a way to tell if something's an initializer list. Um, it's pretty easy to do uh, with a little bit of template magic. Um, so by default, yeah, let's take an initializer list and it's a boost false type. And then we can do a partial specialization and say, oh, well, if I have an STD initializer list, then it's a true type. That's neat. So now we have a way of detecting this, which means we can use boost disable if. Um, to say, hey, if we're in C++11, let's use this disable if and uh, disable it if it's an initializer list. That's actually really, really straightforward. Now, we had a bunch of places where we kind of did weird things like this, and we have to do this multiple times. We expect to have to do that. Um, if you do any kind of weird casting, um, this is a great example of how it is. Um, and the, the neat thing about uh, C11 is they added default types for um, function, uh, templated functions. So you can put that in there. That's not the um, C code for a number of reasons. So. Might it be more general to disable this if your uh, T in is uh, not convertible to T out rather than special casing initializer list? Yeah, so. We have that, um, the, the issue is there were a number of rules. Well, number one, I didn't think about that. Um, number two, there are a number of other rules, not just it's the same size. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some place, like, uh, you can't, ca we have special enumerated types, and we wanted to allow casting to those special enumerated types, um, which are not integral types and not castable as far as the um, STD, uh, the boost cat assignable. Um, okay, so that makes sense. So this worked out really well for us. I, and we went through about two weeks of um, this kind of making sure it works with both standards, and eventually we said, you know what? It's working great. There's we, we have seen zero problems. So let's drop C plus plus O three support. No reason to have it anymore. Um, it's just causing pain. So let's get rid of it. So we only have a 50,000 line code base. At the time, it's grown, but it was 50,000 lines at that point. So it was like way, our problems were way uh, easier. I think your problems will uh, grow as you lines of code grow. Um, okay. So, um, there are a bunch of boost features uh, that are now in the standard library. So, we should drop boost and just start using STD, right? No, it's really bad. Uh, there are tons of reasons why you should not change the STD namespace. Um, the first one, I, I'm just going to give a few examples. The first one is shared pointers and STD shared pointers, so boost shared pointers and STD shared pointers. Well, on the interface, they're equivalent. You know, they look, they, they operate identically, but they are not interchangeable, and that's a big deal. Um, so if you have a third-party library that relies on boost shared pointers, you can't switch, you're tied there. And sure, that's kind of a leaky abstraction. Yeah, maybe you should have wrapped it up, but, well, we certainly didn't wrap everything in a way that would allow us to just switch over to this new one. Um, that's like, so uh, the other thing is boost thread um, and STD thread are definitely not interchangeable, mostly for the lack of an STD thread group. Um, totally makes it a no-go for us. We love boost thread group. 
it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, if we could get in the next standard a STD trade group, I would be very happy. But um, yeah, we can't do it. So and, and another another one. Yeah, what's up? Uh, Red group is kind of simple. Uh, so make the yeah. make sense to actually change Red group to be a very standard Red group. Yeah, I think it's more than 100 lines of code. I mean, you can roll your own too. It wouldn't be that difficult. But yeah. It's just one of the things on the list of, well, we don't want to change it, we don't have to. Um, so the last example is date time is like way better than STD chrono. Um, <laughs> not saying chrono is horrible or anything, but date time just solves everything ever encountered. Um, so that's nice. I think they kind of solve similar problems, but the, the method's totally incompatible on this. Just, if you try, I tried to think about this and say, hey, let's throw out the STL because, or sorry, let's throw out boost in everywhere we can the STL replaces it, because theoretically it's better, but not yet. Um, so here's another example, uh, scope pointer. This is one that people don't really think about. Um, so this is the GDB output of a uh, unique pointer to an integer. What? The actual information is right here. Uh, the rest of this is garbage. Um, it's stuff that I'm not using. I mean, you can kind of see I'm using the default deleter for the end. Yeah, OK. I, I've got some no data fields in the tuple. Scope pointer looks like this. I don't have to write GDB pretty printers or anything to get this to work. It just works. Uh, that's really, really nice. So definitely think about what your debugging tools do when you're considering a change. Go back and say, yeah, but how can I debug this problem? <coughs> if you can't debug a problem, uh, it's really hard to make software. I'm not saying there aren't any advantages to the SDD. Uh, the documentation is, in many cases, better. Uh, it's, it's certainly on the new 11 stuff, uh, catching up to, um, sorry. Boost is spotty uh, on documentation in some places, or a few. Most of the big classes, yeah, it's good on. You can find tons of examples. The STL is going to get way better documented, if only for the fact that everyone's using it. Um, the implementations are smaller, because they don't have to deal with every compiler possible, they just have to care about your architecture. Um, which is nice, shorter compile times, I'm a big fan. Um, now theoretically we'll have better compatibility with third party libraries if everybody kind of gets together and says, oh, let's switch to SDL. Um, but that's not the state of the world right now, unfortunately. Um, it'll get there. You know, you ask me again in five years and I'll say, well, definitely use the STD. Not now. Um, another big advantage, is no function optimizations. Um, so the compiler knows what functions you're calling. Uh, you can actually, it, it can optimize them out more intelligently than just looking at them and saying, or just looking at the, the unrolled template and saying, oh yeah, I'm doing this, hold on, let me put it together for you. Um, as far as the new stuff goes, it's, compilers aren't there yet, at least from my observations. They'll probably get there though. So an example of a change we actually went through. Um, Intel, we're, we're actually big fans of Intel's thread building blocks, um, but their atomic, actually the whole, the whole thing could stand for a little better documentation. If you notice there's a theme going on here, I like documentation. Does anybody here work for Intel? Can you tell? Okay, yeah. It's kind of hard to read sometimes. Uh, most of the time I end up looking through the source and, and going through that, uh, which can be a little painful. Um, there's some other things, like you can assign to an STD atomic on construction. You can't do that with a TBB atomic. The reason for that is they have to adhere to the old O3 standard of what a POD type is, um, whereas obviously this can use the new one. Um, another big factor is atomics are only used internally to classes. 
So it doesn't make sense to expose a lot of these things publicly. Um, so it's really easy to go through and say, oh, hey, today I'm going to uh, update this class to use STD atomic instead of TDB atomic. For better or worse, um, it was really nice for us. And this, this, these are kind of the rules we apply to multiple things. I just think atomic is a great example of this. Um, so definitely consider your advantages when you're considering the change. Okay, so I reached the part that I actually like. Uh, which is the bacon. Um, so this is the new stuff that you can do, and the stuff that we do um, to accomplish tasks. You use a unique point when you give us the bacon, you don't have your bacon anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Well, I mean, you wouldn't want to share your bacon. That was kind of my thought process. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of a, a, a really simple thing. You can find probably a million examples of this on the internet. But uh, it's really helpful for us. We have this function called a, a double hash. Uh, it's, I don't know if Donald Newton invented it uh, or not, but he might have. Um, it's at least in the art of computer programming. So basically what it does is it takes two numbers and then an index, and you can take two linearly independent hash functions and then generate any number of hash values uh, from that function. So it would be really bad if you say, called the first one with only 16-bit integers, uh, and then extended that with zeros, or maybe sign extended it, who knows. Um, it'd be really bad if, if the compiler could generate an implicit conversion there. Um, and in some cases, this, this is producing cases where like W conversion doesn't make any sense. Um, the, the problem with enabling W conversion is there are lots of libraries that depend on that not being turned on, which is kind of painful. So this allows you to say, for this function, I don't want any implicit cast to occur. So the easy way is you say, all right, I'm going to make this other function that takes three templated arguments, um, and I'm going to delete it. So I'm going to get rid of it. So what happens is, if somebody comes along and says, oh, example, that, in the normal case, we say, all right, well, we've got A, B, and then my index, which are all the correct type. It looks at the compiler, looks at these two possibilities and says, oh, well, this isn't a template, so I'm going to call that, because uh, it matches exactly. Now, in the second case, this should fail, because we got it backwards. We said 32-bit and then 64-bit. Well, it doesn't match exactly, but it could certainly you know, convert those values into this double hash function. Uh, but this matches a lot better, you know, because it says I can take anything, and it'll just pull it, but I deleted it, so it fails. And you'll get a nice <coughs> warning that says call a deleted function. Maybe it's not exactly nice, but it's somewhat nicer than uh, the alternative, which is just do the wrong thing. Now, you could, you could actually do the same thing uh, in 03. If you get rid of delete, so if you, if you delete equals delete, um, then you'll have a function that is not defined, and you'll get a link error. So that's something. Um, better errors are nice, though. So you can also do this. You can say, I want to take a variadic number of template arguments and uh, delete anything. That's cool. Uh, that allows you to make like a macro that says disable casts of that function. Because uh, you don't care what the return type is, and you delete whatever you want. Um, this works for anything, which is pretty nice. Um, and it, it makes for actually pretty readable source code. Uh, if you say I'm disabling all implicit tasks for food. Cool. But here's another feature, and this is actually really ugly because it's really hard to write code that works on slides. Um, so this is pretty much the whole class, almost. Um, there's like an assignment, but they look really similar to the constructors. Um, anyway. <coughs> This is one of our cool things. Uh, if, if you were in the exception safe coding on Tuesday, uh, John had a very similar function uh, to this. Um, so basically what you do is you make one, you move the function into your local one, and you set, I'm going to call it to true. Um, and then you can move this, you can move another function into yours, uh, which says, I'm going to move it, and then obviously take its call, and then disable the one that coming from, okay? 
And the key is, in the destructor, if I should call it, call it. Okay, that's really straightforward, and I'll have you to see. Um, now here's the problem. You might want to use a lambda function here. And the problem is, if you, lambda function, if you use a lambda function, that f is a Voldemort type. That's a Alex and Dry Screen term. Uh, it's a type which cannot be named. Um, so it's really easy to solve. In the same air as make pair or make tuple, uh, you can just make a function called on scope exit, which takes, say, a lambda function, and um, then returns a scope exit function with that compiler generated name. Okay, so an example usage is, is here. I want to file handle open something, and then there's my exeter, on scope exit, call close. Which is actually really straightforward and readable code. Um, now maybe for, for something like files, which is so common, you should probably wrap the concept of a file into something else. But you know, if you have little cleanup things that don't make sense as their own resource management objects, this is a thing to use. So why a template? Um, we could have easily done with a, a std function, but the problem is G++ seems to lack the introspection um, to give it the ability to inline an SED function. Uh, there's no way for it to do it, at least right now. Um, I've tried it with the simplest functions. In, in like full optimization, everything possible turned on, it cannot optimize it. Um, and I like giving the compiler more information. It knows exactly the type it's getting called and doesn't have to do anything. Just to, which is kind of one of the reasons why you actually need this function, but the compiler is really smart about uh, eliding that copy, so I like to play to my compiler's optimizations. Um, and really, if you hate the fact that you have to call this on scope exit, then you can just type def that thing and it'll work the same. Uh, so it's really, we have a, a very powerful solution. Yeah? Actually, uh, scope exit of uh, std function is dangerous because when std function tries to construct itself from the provider functor, it could try to allocate memory and fail, and then your DDoR for scope exit Ooh. would not be run, and you would leak your handle. That's a good point. All right, we totally thought of that and did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Perhaps you should well, static assert that its functor type is not std function. <laughs> wow, okay. You learned something every day. Or rather, that its functor type is not row constructible. That would be good. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. So this is really useful for doing post conditions. That's just like another like random cleanup code. Great. It's also useful for post conditions. So if I have a function called shut down, um, I want to assert when I'm done that I'm shut down. And because destruction order is deterministic, put it at the top of the function. This is the last thing that's run. And so you can go do stuff here, and life's good, right? Not quite, because Really, if we've thrown an exception, uh, that's actually what we want to assert that we shut down. If we throw an exception inside of our code, then we don't know if we're shut down or not. Cool? No. This is wrong. Um, because we don't know if we're getting called from the exception of someone else. So say we're getting called from the destructor of another exception that's been thrown, then uncaught exception was already true by the time we made this. We haven't thrown, normally when people think, oh, we're exiting uh, on a failure, that uncaught exception has to have occurred from down here. But that's not necessarily true. Um, so the fix is, grab the uncaught exception before, and then you check, hey, does that equal what uncaught exception is when I'm destroying? Oh, a small caveat, uh, don't ever throw from an on-scope exit probably worth noting. Uh, so anyway, if we look through and you say, all right, well, they're the same now, uh, which means uncaught exception was false going into this function, possibly. So it's false before, and it's false now, then we haven't thrown. Uh, nine. Uh, now, if it's true before, and it's true now, then we also haven't thrown down here. Because if we threw down here, we aborted. No, 
not necessarily crap. In GCC, you will. <laughs> so what happens if you if you have a destructor? You're in exception unwind, and you have a destructor. And the destructor does a try, calls this function. This function throws, the destructor catches the exception and does not let it out, and you will not afford it. But you get this situation wrong. That's a pretty bad thing. OK. Well, dang. Well, it'll catch most of the games. <laughs> here's, I think here's one thing you could do. You could call, oh well, no, it can't, sorry. <laughs> then it's current exception that must give you any exception, just the one being handled by that. So it can't be good. Well, you could catch, so if you caught the in flight one, you can't. Oh, sorry, if you caught the We need to modify uncaught exception that it returns a count of inside exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> One or two. Well, okay. I was going to say you could equivalent to do the same thing for failure, but obviously this will fail you. Um, okay. Well, I'll go into the next section, um, which is this new concept of what we call completions. Um, they're very helpful. Um, and we came up with completions because of the number of problems we have with STD future. Um, and frankly, boost future, uh, because they're practically the same. <coughs> um, so let's say I've got a function called uh, read block. And I give it a connection and some request identifier, uh, and then the volume ID, so some number. And then LBA, uh, which is logical block address, uh, which is kind of like an offset into a volume uh, that you want to read from. So pretend I have a function called do read, and do read can do one of two things. You can either find the value in the cache, in which case it will return you a future that already has a value put in it, or if it doesn't find it in the cache, it'll go dispatch a call to some server and then put the value in future later. Pretty straightforward. Um, and then we say con.respond, we give it a data response with the ID, and then f.get. Now the problem is that this blocks, and that is a terrible square. Um, the problem is that this blocks. Now the contract of futures actually do say, yeah, we're supposed to block here. Um, but that's a problem for us, because if we have, say, a thread pool of 25 threads servicing these requests, and all 25 have to do remote reads, then all 25 threads block, and we've now stopped servicing uh, I.O. from the client, which is really, really bad. And we could come up with a way of, of figuring out, man, uh, now it's ready, but it's really inconvenient to do with futures. Are you simply asking to pull the future whether it's ready? You could. But that's really inconvenient because you have to come up with a pulling mechanism. It's actually wait for std chrono second zero. Right. No, I, I'm not saying that that's, I'm not. what I'm saying is that's the wrong thing to do. Mm. Um, not that it's impossible. Okay. Uh, it's, just, it's inconvenient. So I'll refer to an ancient Perl proverb. You should make the easy things easy and the hard things possible. Um, we revise that and say, make the desirable things easy possibly dodgy things that make some sense, uh, in some cases, to some people, possible, and the undesirable things, impossible. We want to disable operations that we don't want. But things should look like, operations should look like how you want to do them. If I don't want people calling this blocking function, I shouldn't make it as easy as calling it. That's asking for trouble, unfortunately. Um, so, if you'll forgive the pseudocode for a minute, uh, we would really like to add callbacks to futures. Um, that'd be handy. The idea, the, the idea would be, all right, we get the data from the server, uh, we check if it has a value, and if it does, then we get it. Otherwise, uh, on complete, you know, we tell it, hey, later, when you're done, when you have data, uh, please do this function, you know, do this, do this completion for me. Um, 
there's some repeated code here. That's that's not ideal. Um, they're not exactly the same, but they're close enough to the matter. Um, the real problem is the value of has value can change between these two places. So maybe on complete should call the lambda if it got a value. I don't know. I also don't handle exceptions. So maybe has value, uh, you know, so git throws as it normally does. Maybe we should respond with that. Okay, uh, we've got to handle it here too. Pass a pointer. This is getting a little ugly. Um, less than ideal. So the big, the big problem we have is uh, we don't have any way to get callbacks. Um, and there's also no way to cancel an outstanding operation. So if I have a promise and a future, and I stop referring to the future, the promise has no idea that there are no records in the future, and therefore it might as well not even finish. Um, eh. That'd be nice. Um, there's also not a convenient way to return multiple values. We can make wrapper types or use tuples, but okay, it's like death by a thousand cuts. Um, so completions. This is our completion class. There are some other non-interesting uh, functions in there, but these would be somewhat interesting ones. So we'd say, all right, we've got a callback. Um, you can set the result, you can get the result, uh, you can check if it's complete, you can tell it to notify when it is complete, and for whatever reason that returns bool. I don't even know. Uh, and then we've got this weird looking last function that's like is complete or notified. I don't know who wrote this, but um, they're crazy. So We've got a place to hold data. It, standard tuple is great for that sort of thing. Um, you know, we have a place to hold our callback and some state, whatever that means. And what is state? So completion can go through a number of, of places in its life. You start off without a value. You can set the result, and if you set the result and uh, there isn't a callback to call, then it has a value. Pretty simple. Um, and if you set the result, you call the callback, and then you go into completion. And uh, the, the big thing here is that completions can only get the value out of them once, um, which is really nice if you want to return um, like vectors of things. Uh, so we basically force you. Uh, that's the big deal. Um, so we have these two other states where we have disabled. Um, and you can get disabled at any time if you don't have a value. If you do have a value, I guess you can disable too, but it's not useful to disable at that point. Uh, the other state is broken. That means that whoever the promise was made to, uh, the, the guy who actually has maybe the future, um, is no longer referring to it. Um, and, or sorry, the guy who made the promise is no longer referring to it. So it went out of scope and that, that promise was gone. And now our completion is broken because anybody expecting a value there will never get it. Um, that's bad. So I'm going to walk through a couple of the functions, kind of random a little. But um, OK, so set result is just one of these. It's, it's pretty straightforward, actually. Um, you, you take a guard on yourself, and then a, a guard is the same thing as a scope block. Uh, and we can either be in no value or disabled. But we also, turn, uh, we also keep assertions on in uh, release mode. That's important. Um, so if we're disabled, quit, whatever. If we have a callback, Move our x's into the callback, and uh, now we're complete. Otherwise, we put it into our holster, and then we have a value. Now, the big point here is I just used tuples and uh, callbacks and, and uh, variadic template arguments. This code isn't scary. It's actually really straightforward. I mean, it's kind of weird getting used to the dot, dot, dots everywhere, but it's actually quite readable. Um, this is one of the things that we thought about a lot. We said, hmm, these types, these, these new features, I don't know if they're going to be confusing uh, to new developers. It turns out people looking at this can, can get a pretty good grip on it fairly quickly. And it's not immediately obvious, but you know, once you figure out what dot, dot, dot actually means, it's not terrible. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, there are uh, initializing lists there. Okay, so notify and complete. I'm not going to go through the code because it's not interesting to look at. Um, but I will explain why it returns a bool. 
So the precondition is that it has no value, that's the preferred state, um, or it has a value, and that's okay. Um, but in the case where we have a value, we don't set the callback, uh, please get the value from get result. Um, otherwise, return true if we had no value. Um, yeah. So this ends up getting used in a pretty freaking ugly way. Um, this is not pretty code. Uh, you check if you're complete, and then if you don't notify on complete, then you call yourself in line. That just looks really weird. It's actually executing the same code, um, just in different ways. You know, eventually they're both calling complete read. Okay, we've got some repeated code, but we're getting there. Um, it's not too bad. Okay, so then what this other weird one looks like. Uh, this is complete or notified. Uh, what it does is kind of late binding. So, you know, let me go back and explain this one. So, one of the questions you might ask is, is, if you have a notify on complete that kind of returns the same value as is complete, why not just call in the first place and skip the whole is complete check? There's really no reason to because you can say, I can get rid of that and then just call the second part and that'll always tell you um, no reason to do this. The problem is that boost bind um, shouldn't do it in performance critical paths uh, if you don't have to. The performance is not as I mean, it's not meant to be high performance code. So don't do it if you don't have to. So enter is complete or notified, which does everything wonderfully for you. Um, kind of this nested template stuff. Okay. Basically what it does is it checks if we're complete and then quits immediately. Otherwise, uh, we set the callback to bind with capital B um, and then forward all the arguments you supply to it. Um, so this is really helpful if you want to just do like a wrapper around bind. Uh, pretty easy to do. Um, now I'm going to get back to why bind has a capital B there. Uh, suffice it to say that it's really similar to uh, regular STD bind. Okay, so the usage looks like this, which all, your whole condition is one statement. It's not the prettiest, um, but we're getting there. Like we're real close. The repeated code thing is still there. And, and the reason why we, we actually do like the repeated code. Because um, in real code, it looks somewhat like this. And I kind of added the, the guard, I'm going to protect myself and check that I'm in the valid state. OK. Now the thing is, if I'm called in line, there's no reason to do the regard or check that I still should respond. Because I know I just checked that. But if I call this guy, he needs to go because he's been called in a different thread. Um, so we want to kind of work around doing uh, <coughs> unnecessary checks. Okay, but if you don't have that problem, you can easily make a lambda and say, okay, I, I want this function to do it. And it's still not the prettiest, but uh, it's the best we can do. Um, so you can use lambda function to say is complete or notified function. Um, this is why we actually use bind with capital B. Um, because you can't call an STD bind or boost bind on a lambda function. Uh, it doesn't actually make any sense to do that. You've already got the whole function that you want, so you can't bind it again. And it's just weird. Um, so here's what the bind function looks like. And so what we're doing is we're basically saying, oh, we're going to take whatever in here, and then we're going to return you the declared type of some fake binder in this bind function. That's weird. Um, and so basically, we're repeating ourselves again, which is awkward. But we're saying, all right, I want to return this fake binder. So what's a fake binder look like? Okay. Once again, a little ugly um, for this template with the function and arguments. All right. so. Uh, it's not bad. I mean, really, what it comes down to is it just called bind. This decal type stuff is only to get what the result of that bind will be. Once again, it's really easy to use. Um, if you look at it for a little bit, it actually makes sense, even if you don't even know what some of this stuff does. Um, so 
we have a specialization, which takes only one function, or, or only the function, and we say, all right, well, his bind call just returns that function you passed in. Now we know that this is a lambda function, or it's a function that you can just call directly. In either case, it's uh, just this. So that's pretty neat, actually. But we solved uh, a few problems. You know, now you can continue immediately after that callback is complete. Uh, I didn't actually show how we do cancellation because I'm running out of time. But um, and we use a number of things in kind of a readable, manageable sense. Um, and so hopefully you'll be able to do that too. And that is all. Thank you. It has no idea what C11 is. It only does C11 3. Maybe it'll work. Maybe not. are here, and we had everything kind of in its own in, in opt. Um, you have to figure it out for your tools, though. So, uh, how do you deal with when, uh, once, once you turned off the uh, flow three compatibility with the patching, the patching for your own time, you can get to move back and forth to flow three for move uh, back. We don't have any code to deal <laughs> oh. uh, we had so we had a little bit. Um, the, the thing was, we could very easily. Uh, a lot of it has to do with where we are as a company. Um, we can just push changes out. It's not like a huge process right now. It might get to, it probably will in the future, but uh, at the moment. I mean, we have to test it, yeah. but. Oh well, yes. <laughs> Hey, Travis, um, I'd like to get with you on this because um, the next version of Scoot Future should contain um, continuation or chaining code together by supplying some kind of a continuation function object, um, some sort of parallel composition, as well as some sort of way to create a prompt future, something that doesn't wait but comes back immediately. Yeah. Um, so maybe we should get together and have you look at the proposal that we have now. That'd be awesome. For the next version of C plus plus seventeen, Student Future version two. <laughs> that would be really great. I just 
future. It's one of those things we, we the have future, a, future. <laughs> we have a tough time like just composing like if you want to go through we have, a four step process, you know. It's just, yeah, we have that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so ASIO is a pretty good interface um, for a lot of things. We actually used it for some components. The problem is ASIO doesn't, it doesn't respond well to uh, work stealing. Um, it's kind of slow. Um, so we found rolling our own and kind of relying on the OS uh, to do solution for us is just way, way more reliable. Uh, or, sorry, way more So the issue with that is, if you want to always call something, you have to call bind. So even if you don't want to incur the cost of the bind, which is kind of what we're trying to work around, um, you still have to always say bind. So if I want you to go, or, or say I have, well, the bind is the, the big deal. Um, if I want to, if I want to give you uh, something to finish, that means you have to have it when I give it to you. So there's no way to say only only to the bind if it is asynchronous. So that that's the major disadvantage. But we did we actually had a lot of code um, that was just like it would it would be always a spurt, always call the continuation. So you just say all right next do this next do this. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to both approaches. Ours is inconvenient, um, but for performance it's a big. Thank you. 